Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this celebration of the life of Flannery O'Connor. Yesterday was the anniversary of her death, and we're marking the occasion today with music and poetry by two lovers of Flannery, poet, scholar, and teacher, Angela Alimo O'Donnell, and musician and poet, Colin Cutler. My name is Rachel McKendry, and I'm the publicist here at Paraclete. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to Angela and Colin. There they are. Hey, Colin. And I think Angela will be here. And there she is. There's Angela. We're streaming live on Facebook and we're on Zoom for all of you who registered. So thank you so much for joining us today. This is going to be great. Without any further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Angela. Great, thank you, Rachel. Um, thanks to Paraclete Press for um, planning and, uh, and making available the celebration of the life of Flannery O'Connor, someone who is so dear to so many of our hearts. Uh, this of course is, is the anniversary plus one day uh, of her 57th, uh, the 57th anniversary of her passing from this world. So uh, it's great to be able to remember her and celebrate her um, through um, these various forms that we have available to us, forms of art. There are many ways, in fact, to honor the work of an artist who we admire. Many devotees of Flannery O'Connor are scholars who have devoted years to the study and teaching of O'Connor's work. A long list of musician composers have written and performed music that was, that was inspired by O'Connor, a list that includes the likes of Springsteen and Bono. There are films about O'Connor, plays that bring her work to the stage, and visual artists who have depicted her life and her stories. All of these acts of art are also labors of love honoring O'Connor. Today, we would like to contribute our own acts of art and labors of love in this hour-long performance and conversation dedicated to O'Connor on this, the 57th anniversary of her passing from this life. Poetry that is inspired by and seeks to honor O'Connor from my collection, Andalusian Hours, poems from the porch of Flannery O'Connor, and the beautiful music of Colin Cutler from his collection of songs, Peacock Feathers. First, a few words about Flannery O'Connor. Most of our audience members are, I'm sure, familiar with her life, that's why you're here, uh, but it's good to be reminded of some of the particulars as we retell Flannery's story today. Flannery O'Connor was born in Savannah, Georgia on March 25, 1925. At age 13, she and her parents, Edward O'Connor and Regina Klein O'Connor, moved to the small town of Milledgeville in central Georgia to live near Regina's large extended family. Her father died of lupus three years later, leaving his wife and only daughter devastated. Flannery attended high school and college in Milledgeville, finally leaving at age 20 to attend the famed Iowa Writers Workshop. After earning her MFA, she enjoyed a writer's residency at Yaddo, the writer's colony in upstate New York, where she met and became friends with many influential literary figures, including the poet Robert Lowell, and lived for a time in New York City and rural Connecticut while working on her first novel, Wise Blood. In 1951, at the age of 25, Flannery was poised at the start of a promising writing career. And that year she was diagnosed with lupus, a disease she refers to as the red wolf in her writings, and she was forced to return to Milledgeville. She would live there with her mother on the family's dairy farm named Andalusia for the rest of her life, far from her friends and the literary world she had so briefly been a part of. During the 13 years that she lived in Andalusia, she wrote two novels, dozens of stories, many essays and reviews, and hundreds of letters to friends and strangers alike. Her reputation as one of the finest writers of the 20th century rests on the strength of these writings. On August 3rd, 1964, 57 years ago yesterday, Flannery O'Connor died of the same disease that killed her father. She was 39. Flannery O'Connor was a Catholic raised in the Protestant South, a circumstance that allowed her to see her faith and her culture from unique vantage points as a result of her probing vision, O'Connor wrote fiction and nonfiction that challenged received notions of the good and the true and the beautiful. Her stories and novels are unmistakably her own, 
life seen through her own shrewd eye and in her own unmistakable voice. Anyone familiar with O'Connor's writings knows that she says the darndest things. Her letters are full of wit and sass. Her stories are full of compulsively quotable lines. She had a crackling intelligence coupled with a wry sense of humor that came through even in the gravest of circumstances, including when she was in the midst of her own illness. Though it may sometimes seem irreverent or brash, her evident commitment to comedy is in reality a sign of her deep faith. As she once wrote, quote, only if we are secure in our beliefs can we see the comical side of the universe. The poems in Andalusian Hours are acts of imagination. They are not poems that Flannery O'Connor wrote, but rather poems she might have written. All of the monologues but the last one are spoken in her voice, based in words that are excerpted from her writings that stand as epigraphs, especially from her letters and from her stories. Each poem channels her voice as she lives in her exile at Andalusia. Although her daily experience was limited and circumscribed by her disability, she lived a rich interior life, and it is this interior life that these poems attempt to chronicle. The seeds of this project were sown over the course of many decades. The day I read my first Flannery O'Connor story as a freshman in college, I became a devoted fan. Since then, I've read all of her work and shared my enthusiasm for her writing with thousands of university students. In my scholarly life, I've written several books and many articles about her. It's kind of been all Flannery all the time for me for a number of years. As a result of this dedication, not to say obsession, her voice has been in my head for a long time. We have been conversing, at least in my imagination, for a lifetime, creating for me a sense of intimacy and friendship and sisterhood with Flannery. All 101 of these sonnets are poems are sonnets. It's a very elastic form. The sonnet gives each poem structure and music, and to my mind, the rhythm and the rhyme help convey the color and the flavor of Flannery's distinctly Southern speech. The use of the sonnet also pays homage to O'Connor's meticulous craft as a writer. The poems in the book are organized according to the liturgy of the hours, hence, uh, hence the title Andalusian Hours, honoring the, almost or the, the, the very orderly and almost monk-like life that O'Connor lived. She famously refers to herself in one of her letters as a hermit novelist. Flannery is devoted to her faith, to her place, Andalusia, and also to her art. And the relationship between these various vocations is often a source of contemplation for her. The seemingly secular hours she lives at Andalusia are marked metaphorically by the passage of the canonical hours, making each hour and moment in her day a coalescence of the ordinary and the sacred. Just as the hours of prayer move chronologically through the day and night, the poems are organized chronologically, beginning with poems about her childhood and youth, moving to poems of her middle years, and then concluding with poems in which she reflects on her inexorable end. Such patterns are a way of sanctifying time, and I hope the poems give us a sense of the very rich hours lived by Flannery O'Connor and lived indeed by us all. So I'd like to read a selection of the poems today as a way of conjuring O'Connor and making her present to us today of all days. Uh, and we'll also be interspersing the, among the poems songs by Colin Cutler, again, to make her more present to us. As a Catholic, O'Connor believed in the communion of saints, that no one ever really dies. Instead, they are translated to another mode of being, absent physically, but very much present to us in mysterious and profound ways. In a sense, she's already among us. Perhaps the poems and the music might help to make that presence more palpable. And as a last note, I have been asked by at least one reader whether it is presumptuous of me to try to assume knowledge of Flannery O'Connor's inner life and to write these deeply personal poems. And my response to that query is, yes, of course it is presumptuous, as any act of imagination must inevitably be. It is impossible to put oneself in the place of another human being to imagine seeing the world through his or her eyes, or to clothe those thoughts with language without presuming. But this is what artists are called to do. This is what Flannery does. And do it we must with conviction, devotion, and humility. We can never truly know another soul, but love compels us to try. So I'd like to um, read a few poems uh, from uh, the collection. 
Uh, and I'd like to start with the first one in the book. It's one of the few poems that does not have an epigraph. Um, and it establishes the setting of Andalusia. Uh, and the poem is called Flannery Rising. And the one thing that might be good to know is uh, that she refers to the red wolf. And as I mentioned earlier, the red wolf is the term that she uses for lupus. Flannery Rising. Waking early, I took the Georgia light as a sign from God of the wrecked world's end. The nimbus of sun bleached the barn white, hailed from the east like a wandering saint, the bright one, the abbot would most likely send out on a mission. That barn needed paint. The boards were rotting, the roof liked cave. It somehow escaped my mother's keen eye with spoil and squalor, all kinds of decay. Mine too. These soft bones dissolving inside my skin in a gunny sack race to be dust. The red wolf might lame me, but not my lust for this life, this world about to expire. I stand in the light. I welcome the fire. Flannery had a remarkable childhood. Um, she spent most of it in Savannah, and then when she was 13, she moved to Milledgeville. So the next couple of poems are kind of set in her Savannah world. Uh, Flannery had an extraordinary experience when she was five years old. She loved chickens. She collected the chickens. Um, and word somehow got out so that a Pathé newsman came to her town and wanted to take a visual, uh, wanted to take um, footage of Flannery's one chicken that she had taught to walk backwards. Uh, and this was a key moment in Flannery's life. She says about this uh, in her essay, The King of the Birds. When I was five, I had an experience that marked me for life. Pathé News sent a photographer from New York to Savannah to take a picture of a chicken of mine who had the distinction of being able to walk either forward or backward. And this is called Flannery's fame. The cameraman came as a big surprise as much of a surprise as how much I liked it. A star starting its easy rise against the flat savannah sky. It was such a rush to have all those adult eyes trained on me and my trained bird. The hush of expectation assured me that I was different. The kind of child folks sought out, took moving pictures of and bragged about. I was going to be famous if I died trying. But the bird disdained the fame I hungered for. She would not walk the walk. I write stories now, but it's not the same as the day they flocked to gape and to gawk. And you can actually find footage on YouTube of little five-year-old Flannery O'Connor with her, her chicken. Um, it's worth looking up. Um, a couple of these poems also about Flattery's childhood are about the oddness of a Catholic childhood. Um, Catholics grow up um, in, in, in such a way that their imaginations are constantly being uh, stimulated and inflamed um, by the rich stories that Catholic children hear, uh, certainly from the Bible in the Gospels, uh, but also in terms of the storytelling tradition of the saints and the martyrs. They're like superheroes to Catholic kids. Um, so this is a, a poem that uh, that uh, is inspired by one of Flannery's stories, The Temple of the Holy Ghost, in which there's a small girl who is very much a version of Flannery. And at night, when she, before she goes to sleep and says her prayers, she thinks about all those saints and martyrs and tries to imagine which ones that she could be. Uh, and the quotation from the story says, she could never be a saint, but she thought she could be a martyr if they killed her quick. This is called Flannery Considers Her Options. So many ways to go, it's hard to say. Cracked on the rack, hanged and beaten, boiled in oil, flayed and splayed, eaten by beasts, starved for your skin. Anyway, seems rough. It's persistence that counts, how long you can stand it, the pain being less than the terror. It amounts to grit and to nerve, and if you're insane, it helps. When they set you on fire, pound in the nails, cut out your heart, You'll smile, though your prospects are dire. Praise your butcher plying his art. You can savor the taste of the trauma. Sit back and enjoy the drama. Um, many saints are drama, dramatic people, uh, and Flannery was certainly one of them. 
Another interesting aspect of the Catholic childhood, and this is true of Christian childhoods in general to some degree, uh, is the, the degree to which young children are encouraged to think about death. Uh, if you go to the Flannery O'Connor Childhood Home, which I hope you will um, someday, if you look in the, in the, the, the room uh, where Flannery was as an infant, uh, there's her little crib underneath the window. And just out the window, you can see across Lafayette Square, St. John the Divine Cathedral, where Flannery was baptized. Uh, and then above her crib on the wall is a crucifix you know, with the body of the suffering and dying Christ. Um, so even in her infancy, O'Connor and most Catholic children who have crucifixes in their home think about death. Um, and Flannery makes a comment about this in one of her uh, conversations. She says, I'm a born Catholic and death has always been brother to my imagination. And this poem is called Flannery's Twin. I'd be an only child except for him, sleeping in my room with me at night, our twin beds side by side. When we toss the rock for hopscotch, he always rolls a 10. One-footed, I teeter and bend to snatch that stone and hop home safe and whole. Whatever game we've played, he's never lost. Quick at jacks, sharp at cards, fast and light on his feet when we skip rope. My role as his sister is to keep him amused, lest he should grow bored and try to leave. I tell him stories, make him believe he is invincible when he is not. He's a fool, but he's the only brother I've got. Uh, and I'll read one more poem uh, from this group. Um, Flannery, as I mentioned earlier, went to Iowa, uh, and it was a very difficult transition for her to leave her the bosom of her big Catholic family uh, and suddenly be in a world where um, she was at, she was at school with a lot of people who didn't share her beliefs, uh, and it was a great trial to her. Uh, but one of the great gifts of her time at Iowa is she found St. Mary's Church, which is just off campus. And she says about that church in one of her letters, I went to St. Mary's as it was right around the corner and I could get there practically every morning. I went there three years and never knew a soul in that congregation or any of the priests, but it was not necessary. As soon as I went in the door, I was at home. This is called Flannery in Iowa. The kindly faces of the painted saints looked down at me from their distant niches burnt blue of Mary's mantle and the faint flush of blood along her cheek. The wishes I brought to that little church, the swords I laid down on that altar. Marooned and alone, I went there in search of who I needed to become. My mother waited at home, eager for the letters I wrote and posted every blank day. Lonely without her only daughter, she wished there had been some other way. Both of us waiting. For what who could say? So we did what we do. We knelt down and prayed. Uh, and now I'd like to segue uh, into uh, part two of our, um, of our conversation today and talk about Flannery's work. Uh, and I'm very happy and proud to introduce my friend and colleague of music, uh, musician, singer, songwriter, and poet, Colin Cutler, who is going to talk about his project, Peacock Feathers, and perform a song for us. Thank you very much, Angela, and uh, some, some lovely poems there. I've, I've enjoyed reading those over there since, since they've come out. So. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, the Peacock Feathers sort of got its start um, probably back in 2014 or so is about the time that we first met and uh, Angela and I first met. And basically, I I'd, um, I'd first encountered Flannery in undergrad um, when I was at Patrick Henry College. And uh, when I was at infantry school down in Columbus, Georgia, um, all my buddies went up to Atlanta to go, you know, have a weekend of partying. I said, well, I'm going to go make my pilgrimage out to Milledgeville. So I did. And I um, also got to uh, visit Savannah as well and saw St. John's Church and, and you know, her childhood home. And um, yeah, and then as I got more into songwriting uh, a couple years later, um, it, around 2014 or so, you know, realized, oh, a lot of these other songwriters who I've, you know, I've always appreciated, um, you know, including Springsteen, you know, especially in his Nebraska album, were also inspired by, by O'Connor. And a couple of her stories just sort of stuck in my head and then started coming out of the songs. And basically how the songs are written, it's uh, sort of getting into the head of the characters, um, usually before or after the story. Um, sometimes uh, in, in a couple of them, you know, they, they sort of 
tell what happened, but from their perspective, um, instead of having that, you know, third person perspective. Um, yeah, and ultimately going to turn it into a full album, um, hopefully by next year is, is the plan. So I've, I've written a few more since the Peacock Feathers album, and, or sorry, since the Peacock Feathers EP, and uh, there'll be an album coming out soon. So uh, yeah, you can, you can keep an eye out for that. But we're going to go ahead and start off with um, a story based off of probably her most famous, uh, uh, a song based off of probably her most famous story, um, A Good Man's Hard to Find and A Bad Man's Easy. Um, if, if you're not familiar with A Good Man's Hard to Find, basically it follows a family as they're off on vacation and uh, sort of explores the family dynamics of the the grandmother who's trying to get them to go up to, to East Tennessee to, to make the to make the kids world broad and uh, the kids have their own opinions on it which are some great lines and uh, as someone who's been both to East Tennessee and, and Georgia and uh, and all around the south it, it always amused me too um, and with that too I'd like to read a quote too from one of O'Connor's uh, lectures um, kind of on this one um, you know, on this particular story and uh, she says, I've talked to a number of teachers who use this story in class and who tell their students that the grandmother's evil, that in fact, she's a witch, even down to the cat. One of these teachers told me that his students and particularly his Southern students resisted this interpretation with a certain bemused vigor and he didn't understand why. I had to tell him that they resisted it because they all had grandmothers or great aunts just like her at home. And they knew from personal experience that the old lady lacked comprehension, but that she had a good heart. The Southerner is usually tolerant of those weaknesses that proceed from innocence, and he knows that a taste for self-preservation can be readily combined with a missionary spirit. So uh, as, as a, someone with a lot of North Carolina family myself, uh, that, that definitely rang true to me. And uh, this here is a good man is hard to find and a bad man's easy. Just imagine the misfit as he's driving away from the end of the story. So. Said there's two kinds of people. You're going to heaven or you're going to hell. But everybody's got at least a little killer in them. And you touch me and I'd want to shake him too. But a good man is hard to find. And a bad man is easy. Was it love? Was it fear in her eyes? It was something that I'd never seen before. It was like she saw me and she recognized me and I must have jerked back when I shot her cause a good man is hard to find and a bad man is easy. Well, it might be the devil, might be God, it might be both. Might be grace, might be the law, but I don't know. But a good man is hard to find. I said a good man is hard to find. Oh, a good man is hard to find. I said a good man is hard to find. I said a good man is hard to find. Bye. 
bad man is easy. Oh, yes, a bad man is easy. I said a bad man is easy. Bad man is easy. I'm sure I'm not the only one applauding. <laughs> we just can't hear everybody else. <laughs> Such a great song, Colin. Um, thank you. The first time I heard that song, I think, and this is what, what we bonded over, was at a Christianity Literature Conference many years ago, uh, which was at your alma mater of Patrick Henry, as I, as I re remember. And um, you performed that song, and I said, oh my gosh, there's someone in this room who's writing, poem, who's writing songs about Flannery O'Connor. Um, and so we have been following each other's work uh, over the years since then. So um, it's a great, great gift that you have. It's a great song. So thank you. Um, I think okay. at that conference, I'd been planning to read a short story, but uh, about two days before we got there, I called up the organizer and said, actually, I'm going to do some music. He said, all right, go for it. So yeah, what a, uh, yeah, fateful choice, really. <laughs> Excellent choice. And it's interesting to me, I love so many of the lines in that song, but you know, everybody's got a little killer inside them. Um, it re you really have kind of um, mapped on to, you know, Flannery's whole idea about, you know, her theology about sin. All of us are sinners. It's just a kind of, there's a spectrum of possibility. You know, the, the misfit's worse than the grandmother because he's killing people, but they're both basically sinners. Um, and also in her economy of salvation, everybody, of course, is liable to be saved uh, eventually, um, uh, including the misfit. So uh, I'm sure most of the folks in the audience know the story, but I'm conscious of not giving away the ending because it's such a great uh, surprise ending, a powerful ending. Um, but I did want to read a poem or two that sort of speaks to Colin's, uh, Colin's song um, and to O'Connor's story. Uh, and one of them is called Flannery's Misfit. Um, and uh, uh, one of the great lines in that story is um, at the end of the story, the misfit says about the grandmother, who is really the central character of the story. Uh, and, and let's say she doesn't meet the particularly good end. Uh, he says she, she would have been a good woman if it had been somebody there to shoot her every minute of her life. Um, and one of the things that O'Connor is always doing is trying to bring her characters to a precipice of uh, of change, the possibility of change, because they're all desperately in need of being changed. Um, and, um, and in this particular story, the way that the grandmother gets to change is through the encounter with this mass murderer called the misfit. Um, and the misfit takes many forms in many people's lives. Um, and this is a little, uh, this poem is a little com uh, consideration of that. It's called Flannery's Misfit. She would have been a good woman if it had been somebody there to shoot her every minute of her life. A truth that could be said about us all. I've yet to meet any living soul whose disposition wouldn't be improved by a sit down with brother death. A brand new perspective to let him know how short the time, how quick the breath exits your body and leaves you stone cold and mute after so much talk. Same goes for me. I'm dying every day. Sickness, my misfit. I won't grow old, so I need to get wise the fast way. I guess you might say I'm in luck. I stare down the barrel, write what I see, pray it might make a good woman of me. Um, Flannery's stories are kind of famous uh, because very often um, violent things occur, violent events occur in them. Uh, and some readers really find her difficult. They, they, don't, uh, they do not enjoy reading about these violent events that come as such a surprise to the reader. Um, but O'Connor believed that, um, as she says about her characters, their heads are so hard and they're in such need of grace that it takes some violent event to wake them up uh, out of their stupor, um, out of their spiritual malaise and help them to see that they need to, they need to change and they need to accept the grace that's being offered to them every day. Um, so she says something like um, about her use of violence in this little poem. Uh, it's called Flannery's Trick. And this is a quotation from one of her letters. She says, my mother and I live in the country a few miles outside of Milledgeville. The place is a dairy farm, and I'm glad to say that most of the violences carried to their logical conclusions in the stories managed to be warded off, in fact, here. 
though most of them exist in potentiality. Flannery's trick. And it's my stories that save us from the ravages of not so good country people who will steal your fake leg out from under you, marry your daughter just to get your car and abandon her pretty pink head, who will set your woods on fire for fun, kill your family one by one, and leave you on the side of the road much the worse for wear. I couldn't bear to just sit there, let evil have its way with me and mine. So I rise each day and write down horrors I pray don't come true. To fend off the devil, you give him his due. Um, and maybe I'll read one more poem about what she says about her work. Um, she, uh, Flannery, as we know, kept a very, um, uh, kept a very regular schedule of writing. Uh, and she also um, received letters from hundreds of people from across the country, and she always answered them. Um, and some of the people who wrote to her were lunatic, lunatics, basically. She said at one point, I seem to attract the lunatic fringe. Um, and, and people who were mostly kind about her work, but other people who weren't so kind about it. Um, so this little poem is about one of those letters that she got. She says, some old lady said that my book left a bad taste in her mouth. I wrote back to her and said, you weren't supposed to eat it. This is called Flannery's Pottage. I can't help wondering what it tasted like. Burnt biscuits, buttermilk gone sour, potato salad that's turned in the sun. I suppose the tang of fact is bitter. It doesn't set kindly on the tongue. But I know no other way to cook, to tell a story or to write a book. Evil sin and just plain old mistake will salt my stew, no matter what I do to keep them out. They are the spice of life, savory and unsweet, Flavor so true, you can slice it thick with a butter knife. Chicken pot pie made with spoiled chicken. It seems my typewriter is my kitchen. Um, so speaking of flattery stories, um, one that um, Colin has written a terrific poem about um, and that um, I'm very fond of and my students are very fond of, it's called Parker's Back. Uh, and one of the reasons they're so fond of it is because it's about a man who is obsessed with tattoos. Um, he's called O.E. Parker because he never wants to speak his name, a um, very biblical name, um, which uh, is Obadiah Elihu. Um, and it's not until the end of the story that he is able actually to articulate it after he undergoes the changes uh, that have to happen to him in violent ways. Um, so um, I would, I think, I think I'll read it quick poem about tattooing, because Flannery was fascinated by tattooing. And then um, we'll, uh, we'll listen to Colin talk about his attraction to the story and listen to the song. Um, so this is called Flannery's Tattoo. She says, I found out about tattooing from a book I found in the Marlboro list called Memoirs of a Tattooist. The old man that wrote it took tattooing as a high art and a great profession. No nonsense. Picture of his wife in it very demure Victorian lady in an off-shoulder gown. Everything you can see except her face is tattooed. And it says in big letters, he did it. <laughs> so this is Flannery's tattoo. The odd arts we subject the body to trying to improve its imperfections, feed it, starve it, bleed it, carve it, praying for the magic resurrection of beauty lost. A hopeful thing to do, to draw upon the blank slate of the skin, a crest, a breast, a plume of blue feathers, plush and ruffled, eyes inked in, until the perfect bird stares out at you, the vision of the self you hide within. Call it vanity, call it sin, this need to let the flesh speak, plain and true, to map your dying body with your dreams, to love it, despite how doomed it seems. And I'll turn it over to Colin now to talk about the story. Yeah, so um, yeah, so Parker's back. I think I probably encountered that near the end of um, I, basically shortly after undergrad. Like I, when I first encountered Flannery, um, sort, sort of to Rebecca's points, I was like, you know what? I can tell she's good, but I'm not sure if I like her. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I sort of set myself the task because, you know, I just graduated college and you know, I was just working a part-time job at the time. I was like, you know what, I'm going to read all of her short stories and her two novels. And, um, and then from there went into her letters and her essays as well, um, which I, I do think illuminates what she's doing. You know, um, Angela was talking about sort of those surprises, but it's also very much like Greek tragedy. I mean, she loves Sophocles as well, where sort of you get to the end of it and you look back and you realize, you know what, it was kind of a surprise, but it's in the way that like, uh, like Hitchcock is. It's a surprise and you kind of know it's coming, but you don't want to know it's coming. But then once you get there, you look back and realize that it couldn't have happened any other way, really. And that's um, that's, that's kind of what uh, Flannery does. And Parker's back. I like, I mean, I, I, have, I have my own tattoos too. I, I don't know if you can see them, but, um, uh, but also, you know, he, I'm, I'm a veteran and he was, you know, ran off to the Navy for, for a while himself and um, sort of his interaction with his very fundamentalist, um, uh, wife, which I was not raised Catholic, I wasn't raised in a Pentecostal household myself. So there were a lot of things that uh, that resonated there. Like we went to Tent Revival in Illinois several, several times. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so there's a lot of familiarity there. Um, but also, I think it is the story which most clearly sort of embodies, embodies her sort of incarnational vision, um, if you will, of art. Um, literally in Christ being tattooed in, into, uh, into, you know, Parker's skin, into Oe's skin. Um, so this song here, um, it's not actually recorded yet. It's going to be on the new album and it's going to be one of two. I'm, I'm going to do two on Parker's back. Um, one sort of him at the beginning, you know, before the story ever starts uh, running. And then this is him sort of at the end of it, sort of looking back. So. <laughs> She wanted her godly boy, didn't know God was wild. Ma dragged me to revival, so I ran off to the flea. I got stuck with pins and needles, they're still itching in my feet. The Navy and my mama were the only ones who knew. There was something burning deep inside me, I'll tell it straight to you. Nobody ever hears my name. I've been running from it all my life, and yes, it's a shame. Well, it takes that. Sorry. It's restless heart, it takes tender loving just to tame. And nobody ever hears my name. Look at me as happy. As a cat that stepped to the ship, I can't help it if the highway promised it would scratch my itch. I don't even like the cooking, you'd burn up the butter beans. You're so damn busy praying, you forgot the pork and the collard greens. Somehow I married you, though I'd almost rather die. All I get are words like ice picks. Sticking in my sack Nobody ever hears my name I've been running from it all my life And yes, but it's a shame Well, this restless heart it takes a tender Loving just to tame And Obadiah ever hears my name Well, we never promised heaven this house is cold as hell It's awful hard to love your neighbor If you can't love yourself And I do confess that I love drinking Cigarettes and sin I got the image of a living God tattooed into my skin But you beat him when you saw him Till it burst my brittle heart His eyes were like a burning light He'd rather love me and Obadiah hears my name I've been running from it all my life And yes, but it's a shame This restless heart, it takes a tender Loving just to tame And Obadiah hears my name 
Obadiah, it is my name. I've been running from it all my life, I guess. But it's a shame. Well, it sure caught my attention when that tree went up in flames. And Obadiah, it is my name. And Obadiah, it is Terrific, Colin. I really love that one. Um, I love the ballad meter. I love the the, um, the way that you capture um, O.E. Parker's voice, uh, who really doesn't have a voice in the story because O'Connor tells the story from the third person perspective. And he does say a few things, usually curses. <laughs> <laughs> So I appreciate the cat who stepped in shit because the kinds of words that oh he says probably wouldn't fly, but but that's fine. My other favorite line was I confess that I, I love drinking cigarettes and sin, but I've got the son of God tattooed upon my skin. Did I get that right? Yes, the, the image of the living God. Yep. <laughs> the image of the living God. That's even better. Um, and that captures one of the you know fascinating and wild points about that story is that for for O. E. Parker. The tattoos are a form of redemption. Um, uh, for our listeners, if you know that story, you know that, that the moment for, for, uh, that, that hits Parker upside the head is when he's a little kid and he goes into one of the tents at the fair and he sees a, one of the so-called freaks. Freaks are often a means of redemption in O'Connor stories. And it's a man whose whole body is covered with tattoos. And, um, and Parker says, thinks to himself, he thought of himself as ordinary as a loaf of bread. Um, and of course, there's that Eucharistic image, of course, bread, and, 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 but that man somehow is beautiful. And so the rest of his life, he aspires to become him, uh, but can't quite manage to do it. Uh, so, you know, I, I, O'Connor's the only person I know, writer I know, who can get away with writing a story about redemption in which tattooing is the means of Parker, uh, Parker's salvation, ultimately. So great, great, great story and, and a great, great song. So thank you for that. Um, and that's actually a kind of a good transition into our third portion of our performance for today, which is think about Flannery's death and, uh, and her legacy. Um, there is a sense of, uh, you know, redemption that O'Connor finds in her writing uh, and also finds in, um, in her illness. She says in one of her letters that sickness is like a country, uh, that, that, a place that you visit, but you can only visit alone. No one else can come with you. And she says it's more instructive than a trip to Europe. Um, so even though obviously she suffered terribly from lupus, uh, she also felt that it taught her something every day. Um, the, the fact of her own mortality, um, the fact of everyone's mortality, and the fact that she was every day when she was writing her stories, she was seeing in the light of eternity um, rather than being um, you know, distracted by all of the things that most of us get distracted by. Um, uh, her stories look very clearly uh, at, at death. Um, so I'd like to read a couple of poems uh, about that uh, experience of O'Connor um, with her, her lupus. Uh, one of them is called Flannery in the Bull Ring. Uh, and I actually wrote this poem when I was in Spain a few years ago. Um, I saw in the audience that Francis Florencourt is with us today. Fl Francis is Flannery's cousin. So welcome, Francis. It's great to see you. Uh, and Francis was at that conference too. It was the International Flannery O'Connor Conference. Um, and I did happen to go to a bullfight. And somehow a bullfight just struck me as, um, as uh, something that O'Connor would have appreciated uh, in some kind of way. So I was trying to connect, um, connect that experience of the bullfight with uh, Flannery. And uh, it, I do it in this poem, if I can find it. I'm having a hard time. Oh, here it is, Flannery the Bullring. Uh, in one of her letters that Flannery writes, this is the 5th of July, 1964. This is four weeks before her death from lupus. And she says, the wolf, her lupus, the wolf, I'm afraid, is inside tearing up the place. And this is called Flannery in the bull ring. They call him the wolf, but he is a bull. And I'm in the ring with him every day. He weighs 1,000 pounds to my 110 and runs fast and hard as a steam engine raging down the track toward hogtied me. I try to sidestep, wave my peacock colored cape before his dumb face, but I seem to be all his bull's eyes see. I wonder what it's like to be well. 
and cannot live this life, this daily hell of trying to keep my own death at bay, fumbling for a sword, angling for a way to stab his black hump, pierce his black heart, and master at last the matador's art. Um, another um, experience, uh, a you know, crucifying experience for O'Connor was not just the disease, but also the medication that she took to ameliorate the disease, which was massive doses of different kinds of steroids. Um, and there was a particular drug called ACTH, which was made from the hormonal secret secretions of pigs. And at the time, it was the only treatment they had for lupus. Um, and Flannery says in one of her letters, I owe my existence and cheerful countenance to the pituitary glands of thousands of pigs butchered daily in Chicago, Illinois at the armor packing plant. If pigs wore garments, I wouldn't be worthy to kiss the hems of them. Uh, and one thing that you might want to know about this, uh, one of the terms in here, uh, those of you who may know something about the slaughtering of animals, there's a creature that they call, this is in particular connection with sheep and lambs, the, the Judas sheep. Um, and this sheep will go in and lead all the other uh, sheep to slaughter. And he won't flip out. Most animals flip out when they smell the blood and they know something is going to happen. He doesn't, he just leads them right in. So they don't kill that sheep. They take him out and they use him again to lead the next group in and the next group in. And he's called the Judas sheep. Uh, so this is called Flannery's pigs. I see them lining up for slaughter. Judas at the head of the pack, grunting his way to survival, while my pigs do not stand a chance, doomed creatures that they are. And it's a good thing. The fact is they save me. Without them, I'd be dead as they are after the bloody deed gets done. I'm not one to sentimentalize. I'd win no prizes for sweetness in the sweepstakes of life. Earth is a hard place, but you get used to it. I can't weep for what must be, nor can I erase the need that blinds and binds us. The debt I owe is big. Each day I rise alive. I am the Judas pig. Uh, and then one more poem about uh, O'Connor's last days, since we're honoring and thinking about them right now. Um, this is a, a note that she wrote in um, uh, a letter that she wrote July 8, 1964, again, four weeks before her death from lupus. She says, yesterday the priest brought me communion and it looks like a long time before I'm afoot. I also had him give me the now called sacrament of the sick, once known as extreme unction. This is called Flannery in Extremis. I like the old name better than the new, containing as it does the Latin root for those in extremis, meaning dying, not sick. Sacraments ought to tell the truth. When he blessed my eyes and ears, lips and hands, I felt how lucky I'd been they were mine. For how else would I know and love the world were it not for these gifts I've received? And now there's another gift I want, time. Oh, I know we all have to go, leave this life for the next, but I'm perplexed. Pearl gates and angels, celestial bands of hymn singing saints are not my speed. This green earth is all the heaven I need. And now I'd like to ask Colin to play one of his most beautiful songs uh, based on uh, the story of the lame shall enter first uh, about a little boy who uh, longs to see his mother in heaven uh, and it's called Mama. I don't know what heaven is. Mama, I don't know where heaven is, but I hear that's where you go, Mama. Oh Lord, but I'll be there with you for too long. Well, Papa, he says you've gone away. Well, there ain't a heaven or a Father, he says you've gone. Away. You ain't bad. 
mama I don't know where it is But I hear that's where you've gone Mama I don't know where it is Oh Lord But I'll be there with you before Sister, she was a baby, and I hear that she's up in heaven too. Sister, she was a baby, oh Lord, and I wonder if she seen. There's a boy out on the streets as you've seen Jesus play Way up where hung the stars Says there ain't no more Cripples and crying And I won't be there where you are Cause mama I don't know where heaven is, but I hear that's where you've gone. Mama, I don't know where heaven is, oh Lord, oh, but I'll be there with you. Oh, yes, I'll be there with you. Oh, yes, I'll be there with you. Too long. And I think, thank you. The beautiful version of that song, by the way, on the EP. Um, I think the link is in the chat. Uh, with um, what's the name of your the, your friend who does the um, vocals with you? Stacy Miller. Yeah, we recorded it as a duet, and she sounds for all the world like cats and flies. So. <laughs> yeah, there's and all, there's also a beautiful fiddle in in the production as well. It's it's, all, um, it's a, a lovely version as well. Um, doing music. So, together. I'm sorry. Oh, that's Kristen Mack. We've been doing music together for about seven years now. So wonderful. Thank you, Colin. Um, and I think we'll close just with one more um, poem um, that uh, reflects on Flannery's very rich spiritual life, her very rich faith life that she kept right up until the end, um, the end of her life. Uh, and there's a beautiful uh, quotation in Flannery's prayer journal. And that's uh, those who may not have read it, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a journal that she kept when she was at Iowa, a young woman of 20, 21 years old. Um, basically, there are a series of prayers, letters to God, in which she's asking God um, to take care of her, to help her to keep her faith, uh, and also to discover how to be the kind of writer that she's meant to be. Uh, and one of the last entries is particularly moving. She says, what I'm asking for is really very ridiculous. Oh, Lord, I am saying, at present, I am a cheese. Make me a mystic immediately. And this is called Flannery's Prayer. Sometimes I tire of waiting for the transformation, the moment I move from milk product to holy hallelujah, halo on my head instead of rind, my smell suddenly sweet instead of sour, a rose growing amid the dairy farm of life. My mama and my proper Catholic aunts pray for rain, good weather, won't they be surprised to learn what their odd daughter hankers for? Wisdom to light on me like a pet bird pecking its feed from my open hand. Vision that permeates walls and doors that shut me up and away from your love. The stuff that cheeses like me dream of. Thank you everybody for listening today. Um, 
and we're very happy to take any questions or comments that people might have in the few minutes that we have left. For the benefit of everyone on Facebook Live, not on Zoom, we had a great question uh, for Angela from Rebecca Gates, who mentioned that she met Flannery through her letters so many of us had and she was still working up to her stories and asking for advice about which stories to start with so Angela I don't know if you're willing to share your answer there oh yeah absolutely it's a it's, it's a great question because you know there are 31 great stories um and so where, where's the entry point good man is hard to find is really her signature story it's the one that everybody knows and it is of course the most the most shocking of her stories and it's also a story that she wrote when she was younger not very young but younger so i think that's a great place to start um i love personally uh, a temple of the holy ghost because that's the story that has the little girl in it that's very much like flannery mm -hmm. um so i recommend that one um also good country people is another great story hilarious and outrageous and um and you know smart and theologically sound and then the last story that she wrote, I uh, actually wrote it on her deathbed, along with she finished Parker's back when she was very ill too. O'Connor would hide her manuscripts under her pillow so the nurses wouldn't take them away because um, she was determined to finish these stories before she died. Um, and her last story is Revelation. And that is a beautiful, powerful story. Um, so yes, I, I would make sure I read those four uh, and then enjoy the others. Maybe, maybe Colin has another, uh, another suggestion. Those were the exact four that I'm, um, and I usually use Revelation as sort of an introduction, you know, when, when I teach her, um, so I feel like that's one of the most accessible ones. It's not quite as shocking, you can, you can sort of you know, ease the man a bit, um, but yeah, those, those are the exact four that I would recommend as well as Parker's back. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. I've been um, attempting to share links in the Facebook comments and in the chat here, but um, everyone who registered to be here via Zoom today. We'll get an email with these links too. And um, just a note that to celebrate the day, to celebrate all things Flannery as we love to do, if you want to, you can order Angela's books with us on the Paraclete website. Uh, there's a link there too. And if you use the coupon code Flannery, you'll get 20% off today. So we thank you, Angela, for your work and for sharing. I should also say that we um, have been able to do some fantastic webinars with you, Angela, and we do have those recordings on the Paraclete YouTube channel. Um, I always feel like I've been to a seminar <laughs> that we should be able to earn credit for because your teaching is so fantastic. So um, those resources are available through Paraclete too, thanks to Angela. And uh, oh, Rebecca says, thank you. At age 72, I'm still a hunk of cheese. <laughs> we all are. We're all cheesy, you know. <laughs> so true. <laughs> anyway, thank you again, Angela. Thank you, Colin. This has been great. It's our first musical Zoom. So this worked beautifully. I'm so happy. Thanks to all of you who joined us. And we hope to see you again soon. Great. Take Ciao. care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Colin. Bye, Rachel.